Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge. This week's episode is going to be a real treat, and I'm sure very popular. We have a dear friend of mine with us, Sayerji, who, let me tell you why I invited him on. He is like a walking encyclopedia of all kinds of information that all of us need to know and maybe just don't have access to. He has a website called greenmedinfo.com, and I always... Uh, recommend this website to people who, for example, maybe you want to convey an idea to a family member, but they won't listen to you because you're family. And so there's this incredible resource that has curated biomedical research abstracts. And so you can find all of the latest and greatest and cutting edge information on this website so that you can share and also learn. So Sari G is an author, he's an activist, he's a speaker and a widely recognized thought leader in the natural health and wellness space. He's a reviewer at the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. He's co-founder and CEO of System Bio- Biomed. He is vice chairman of the board of the National Health Federation. He's advisory board member for the World Mercury Project, co-founder of Exosome Media Group, reviewer and editor of the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. My God, you do so much. Steering committee member of the Global GMO Free Coalition, vice chairman of the National Health Federation, advisory board member of the Fearless Parent and co-founder of Alliance for Vaccine Awareness. Recently, Sayerji has been featured in What's with Wheat on Netflix and a ton of other programs. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> um, thank you. The honor is completely mine. I'm really excited to be here. So uh-huh. we usually start each episode with a little exercise. We'll, we'll just get you to close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees. And just think about what you were doing, who you were with, and see if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical. And then in your mind, think of three words that you would use to describe the personality of that favorite. And then whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and share with us what you were thinking, where you were, who you were with, what your favorite was, and the three words you would use to describe its personality. Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> I wasn't sure. okay. We're in the edge of our seats. So we want to know. I know. Well, it's, it was a great exercise because I went to kindergarten in, in Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I was in Dortmund, and we used to go to the Black Forest there and oh. play, yeah, in these piles of leaves with my father and my mom and sister. And I think of the pine, you know, trees there. They were just so majestic and you know the, the I just think of like you know this like just vibrant and like powerful and just like this really beautiful scent so those are the things that came to me immediately thanks to your exercise what does the beautiful scent remind you of or what is it how does the beautiful scent make you feel and it's just sort of like cleansing and then very focusing like in sort of in the third eye area <laughs> Love it. Okay, so the, what we find is the way you describe your childhood favorite typically will describe the way that you bring your greatest gifts into the world. So majestic, vibrant, powerful, cleansing, and focusing. I love it. That's totally you. Oh, uh, cool. Thank <laughs> you. I didn't realize it would reveal that. <laughs> Busted. Busted. <laughs> yeah, so... There are so many things we could talk about. We were just chatting about this before we hit the record button, right? And maybe we should start with, because you have a new book coming out with the topic of new biology and sun, because it has a lot to do with flowers, right? And our listeners have a fair understanding of flowers. Yes. What should should we know about new biology? Okay, that's exciting, actually, the topic, because when it comes to sort of the quote, new biology, you know, we've seen this just dramatic transition since around 2000, 
with the discovery of the microbiome. It's you know pretty much a household n- name now. And what it did is it sort of was a, like a Copernican revolution where suddenly we realized that you know our contribution genetically is a, it's just a fraction. It's it's relatively infinitesimal to the total contribution of all the microbes in our body to to our our gene pool, if you will. And that was a blow to the ego in many ways. And certainly the scientists were up in arms about that because it really sort of corrodes that monolithic, you know, hermetically sealed concept we have of what genes are and how powerful they are. You know, suddenly bacteria, viruses, they're, they're contributing, fungi. Then it moves out to the world because we get our microbiome, obviously, through our food, the soil, and actually originally through our mother. So technically, if the mother, through a natural birth, contributes about 99.9% of the original bacteria that make up who we are, that's actually what they call in biology uniparental inheritance. And there's sort of like a matrilineal, matriarchal bias that is embedded into our species self-definition that is hardly ever given attention. So it's sort of almost a threat to the ego, to the patriarchy, and to a lot of the old biological orthodox views that have held strong for centuries. And that was just the microbiome, because in 2000, the literature just exploded. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. So when you say the old biology, are you referring to the concept that say, this is my body, and outside of me are pathogens, and if I get a cold, for example, a virus came in and attacked me. So there's this kind of oppositional relationship with nature. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. In fact, the very definition of virus has shifted dramatically from, you know, that which causes death and disease, like, you know, vectors of lethality and morbidity, (laughs) you know, to actually- Intense. (laughs) I know. They're like, they're like, actually, they're very similar to like a medieval demon is that a lot of the old views were just sort of transferred to medical jargon. I mean, even doctors became priests, right? So fighting germs was really like fighting demons. And what we know now is chromosome, I mean, sorry, viruses are pieces of genetic information in search of chromosomes. And in fact, viruses are primarily comprised often of host proteins and lipids. So only about, oh, was it five years ago, did they first even analyze what a influenza viral particle was, what they found is that it's mostly constituted through the tissue of the host it infects. So a human viral particle from from the influenza family is going to be comprised primarily of proteins and lipids. It steals from the host. And so you go a little bit deeper and you realize then also that viruses often are just co-opting what are really in endogenous pathways in the cells, which use these little viral particles to communicate. They're called exosomes, actually. Oh my God. Your vocabulary is incredible. Endogenous? Is that what you said? Sorry, yes. That is such a great word. Okay, let me break it down just just to make sure I'm following you, okay? Because your vocabulary is incredible. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So what you're saying then is that if we're talking about a common flu, Mm -hmm. you're saying that the flu is not coming from outside of us. You're saying that it's actually coming from within us. And there's just like a little spark, a little catalyst, a little something that wakes that up inside of us. So what is, you know, I find it interesting that you brought up the flu too, because one of the first times that I sent someone to your website was I, I had this client who was really, really distraught because she was having a new grandchild and she was beyond excited to see the new baby. And the parents of her, of her grandchild said, in order for you to be able to hold the baby, we Mm. need you to get a flu vaccine. And so she was just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like I've gotten off all pharmaceuticals. I've made my life's, you know, a priority to stay off pharmaceuticals. I've been taking flower essences for 15 years. And wait a minute, now my son is telling me that in order to hold my grandchild, I need to get a flu vaccine. So what I did was look up on your website, the resources and the the abstracts about how flu vaccines can actually be harmful. And then that way she had something to arm herself with and be able to send to her family and say, hey, maybe that's not such a great idea. Here's why. 
from a source that would be a little more, you know, like publicly recognized. So what do we need to know about, say, the flu and flu vaccines? Such a good anecdote and question, because fundamentally, if we acknowledge that the influenza viral sequences and the particles within which they're found are actually naturally in our body, they're part of the human virome, which is a vast array of viruses that include things like herpes family viruses that we used to think were deadly, which de do sometimes bloom, if you will, when the conditions are right. So susceptibility to disease is really determined by your immune health versus irregardless of your immune state, there are these evil particles out there. And that's why you see these global campaigns claiming that a pandemic is going to wipe out hundreds of millions if we don't all vaccinate, vaccinate ourselves preemptively. Well, the problem, as you pointed out, is that if you really look at the top of the line research, um, let's look at the Cochrane Collaboration, which is independent scientists that are looking at all of the literature, doing meta-analyses, and they're actually even vetting it for industry-funded literature versus that which is more trusting or trustable. Those meta-analyses historically have found that influenza vaccines are not effective, nor have been, they've been proven to be safe. And this is across the board. Children, especially, there's only two safety studies ever performed and then we're talking about something like 50 years of literature, which is a, a obscene given that the FDA and Health Canada now pretty much mandate at six months of age and over every year you're supposed to get one, right? A flu vaccine? Yeah. That's, every year? That's their recommendation is that. And it, wow. And the challenge is that all the meta-analyses on healthy adults, the elderly, healthcare workers that work with the elderly, none of them show compelling evidence that they're effective nor that they're safe. So when you really think about it, like who do we trust? Of course, the CDC says, you know, it's called eminence-based medicine because we trust them, we assume they're correct. But e evidence-based medicine is what we all want. We want the truth. And we want it to be vetted by research. So when you actually go down the rabbit hole, you look at these vaccine studies, it is amazing, Katie, to find that the, the research is on the side of they're not effective and they're not safe. And therefore, you know, what what is what is what is precautionary is to, to not involve yourself with them, you know. And would you say that that is a similar case in other types of similar vaccines, say like all the things we give kids like polio and measles and mumps and rubella. What's the story on vaccines? That's a great question. I would encourage anyone looking to go deep into this to look at Suzanne Humphrey's work because she's an incredible MD who basically looked at all the historical records from the highest level, you know, the CDC, et cetera. And they and, and clearly showed that when mass vaccination campaigns were introduced, there had already been a precipitous drop in the incidence of both infection cases and then mortality from these different, you know, quote, vaccine preventable diseases because of the transition to modern sanitation, hygiene, refrigeration, nutrition, even, even lower poverty levels. That all contributed to improving the terrain, which is the whole other view of health, which is that, you know, technically like a forest floor, bacteria, virus, fungi help to degrade material that is no longer useful. And they're actually serving the immune function versus they are the cause of the damage to the tissue. It's like saying the Band-Aid caused the injury on which it, it's, it's being placed. <laughs> yeah. so, so really, I encourage people not to take my word for it. Go to the literature itself, if you will, or look at these, you know, experts that have a background in science or medicine that are are saying the same thing and they're pointing you to the actual statistics which do not support that the modern vaccine uh, schedules are evidence-based safe or effective and this is what you would recommend for say a mom who just had a baby and she's debating like oh god do i do the vaccines do i not do the vaccines absolutely i think it's probably um you know it's it's probably the most important question you could ask is you know whether or not you can justify vaccinating pre preventively because that's the idea is you're infecting, right, children with often even live 
infectious components like the MMR, for example, still contains actual infectious measles, which causes infection and even causes these vaccinated children to shed. Is that really a model we can embrace to, to, to infect someone with small amounts of the disease to try to prevent the, the, them from getting you know, more serious? It's sort of like oxymoronic, actually. What do you mean when you say shed? What, that's a common term. What does that mean to shed? Yeah, so what happens is that with, for example, chickenpox or varicella vaccine, you're actually infecting individuals with what they call attenuated or weakened versions of that virus. And the assumption is that it won't go full, full bore and cause the normal symptoms, which anyone can watch an old Brady Bunch episode. And it's people went out of their way to infect each other to, to get that immunity through the herd. Right, right. Uh, it wasn't deadly. It never really. It, it, it's it's been completely misconstrued as was as is measles now. So the idea is that shedding is what happens when you get a vaccine strain. It, it's it's actually it doesn't present as acutely as would wild type, so to speak, but it but it stays slower in the system and it may actually contribute to other serious uh, health issues such as cancer and cardiovascular disease, which has now been recently validated by. And, you know, very, very high gravitas literature that not being infected will cause your immune system to blow back on itself. So you have what's called adaptive or Th2 dominant diseases emerge like cancer because your immune system was never properly challenged by what would have been natural exposure. You know, it makes you stronger to have these challenges and overcome them and you have lifetime immunity. Vaccines try to co-opt or supplant that, but, you know, again, it's never really been proven safe or effective. Right. And it's, they will, yeah, they will use surrogate markers. So, in, in, for other words, they'll eject you with an antigen, and it's like kicking a beehive. They measure the, the antibody titer levels and say, oh, we've increased them. This means you're more immune. But, there's the, but the affinity of the antibody to the antigen is never proven. And real world effectiveness is differently, different from vaccine efficacy, which is a surrogate marker. So, you get into the language, it sounds so obscure, but let's just say that. Even the, the, the Gardasil vaccine, it, it was never studied in human trials. It was actually only through FDA fast tracking and surrogate approval. So it was never proven safe or effective for any human before it was on the market. Okay, let's just, can we just dive into that for like two seconds? Gardasil. So yeah. becoming required in many states for young girls to combat supposedly the HPV virus, which right. by a certain age, what is it, 30 something, 90% of all women have it in their bodies, could even argue 100%. Yes. So why would we force our adolescent young women to get this vaccine, which yeah. for something that's not even really harmful that all women have and there are adverse effects to getting this vaccine, right? Absolutely, yeah. We know for a fact that HPV exists naturally in the body and at a very early age, it's probably transferred just through contact with mother and father. It's, it's not intrinsically a carcinogenic vector. Add other elements in an experimental setting, you know, put some chemicals in and you might see some dysplasia or cell growth that looks like precancer. But the reality is even when you see cervical dysplasia, about 90, was it 5% after, uh, I think it's 20 months, will naturally regress. Like many of the cellular abnormalities we now over-diagnose, over-treat. Yeah. And you're, you're talking about women go in, they get a pap smear, and they get a result that says you have some abnormal cellular growth. And so you're saying that if we get those kinds of results, we don't need to freak out and get in arms and say, oh my God, I'm getting cancer. It's just simply that... It comes and it goes. It's like having a, a cold sore, and then it goes away. Something gets inflamed, and then it calms back down based on your stress level, in immunology, and mm -hmm. like lifestyle and epigenetic, epigenetics, right? Absolutely, yeah. There is no conclusive evidence that HPV vaccine could ever, I'm sorry, HPV virus, and there's actually dozens of different types, which makes it far more confusing, has ever been shown to cause a single cancer as if there's a vacuum, right? You have this vector again of carcinogenic lethality, you either have or you don't. And if, if there's any indication the cell has changed, instead of admitting you have an immune system and there's cell turnover every single day and that your body can heal, they assume that, okay, preemptively, it's like preemptive war, the Bush doctrine. Oh, you think this Middle Eastern country might 
have weapons of mass destruction. We find out later they don't. So you're going to preemptively invade, bomb, kill hundreds of thousands because to you that's preventive, right? And then you find out later there was nothing there. But of course, then you blame the victim and then you, you get a terrorist backlash that wasn't there originally. And that's what happens with overtreatment. You start irradiating people and cutting into them. And before you know it, the cells do end up experiencing changes that are consistent with aggressive cancer. And But you never blame your intervention. You blame the victim. You say, oh, it was just treatment refractory, or this vaccine didn't work. It's just especially... <laughs> it's just psycho a, babble. Yeah. What a rabbit hole. Okay, so in you can probably relate to this. In my flower essence training, and there's very little, you know, double-blind studies around any of this stuff, so we'll just put that out there. But in my flower essence training we would typically see the the body as like a projection of our energetics. So if if you, for example, were looking at, say, a PowerPoint and you saw something obstructing your view, you wouldn't go to the wall and try to clean it off. You'd go back to the lens of the projector, remove the piece of dust or whatever, right? right? And, and so you're in the flower essence world, your energetic state is the root cause of all things. So when something manifests in your physical body, it's merely a red flag to go back and say, what emotional, mental, spiritual thing that I shove under the rug, did I avoid, did I not look at, did I not get real and vulnerable and authentic with? So that, you know, which is normal, we all do that so that it would need to manifest on a physical level to really catch my attention. Mm. So how does, how does the new biology tie into that? And does that, is there actual research out there that would point to this as truth? Oh my gosh. I love this Katie, because this is the new biology in the sense that for many years, we have identified the carcass, you know, of the body as being the most real. That's sexy. <laughs> I know, right? Walking carcasses. <laughs> walking carcasses, right? It's just these, like flesh robots, you know, with some <laughs> spark that we misidentify as consciousness. But yeah, the concept of our body being a projection from a deeper, subtler, more real part of us, which we actually feel, sometimes we can call it our soul, you know, it's just so beautiful and it's so real to those who have had the great fortune of experiencing that. I've gone the spectrum, you know, because I was born into the world uh, injured, I believe, vaccine. I can't be sure, but I, I was very severe bronchial asthmatic at six months. And they'd inject me with adrenaline, basically, the fight or flight hormone to keep me alive. You can only imagine when that puts you, that state of fight or flight when your most basic, you know, survival brain is active, called reptilian. You, you, you do feel like a piece of flesh about to be eaten. But on a subtler level, <laughs> the one you're talking about, the one that subtends, I believe, this grosser, grosser layer, it's like vibration, the, the slower vibrating, grosser layer of the integument of the onion on the outside is this fleshy body. The body. Yeah, but then the subtler like level, like emotional body is actually what makes possible, you know, the physical. And that's something that, of course, in the Western sort of Cartesian view, there's two substances, you know, the physical object, which is the body, and then there's the, the mind as if they're completely ontologically two separate things. And what we know is that you know, that view, the brain is, okay, is like the kidney, right? And urine is like consciousness. It, it's an epiphenomena. And, we're, you know, it's just sort of like an illusion. But then actually, it's the other way around. Like Aldous Huxley said, is that the uh, brain actually is a reducing valve. It's what prevents us from experiencing infinite consciousness. So when you flip the script, because you hear people say, oh, we only use like 5% of our brain. Right. You don't really get the concept that the brain isn't this super technology that makes possible the spark. So I know this is very like very brain oriented what I'm saying. And I think you're talking to a deeper reality actually, because when you have done your ceremonies, I can speak directly to this because just a few days ago, my partner had a 40th and we had the incredible honor of having you orchestrate this most beautiful ceremony, plenty of uh, flower essences and just the energetics that you bring. And that was an experience of, of what I would call psychedelic, like, which means to reveal the soul. 
And, and it was so subtle, yet so global. It was like a flower consciousness. And then I looked and I turned out it was the flower full moon for the year. You know, that was the, the name of this full moon. So I love what you're saying. You're saying fundamentally that, you know, our emotional body or self or soul is actually, I think, more real. Now, it doesn't mean that over time when there's disease and, it, and there's a physical you know, breakdown that you can then just go put flower remedies all no. over. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can yeah. give us more on that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I would say, you know, it, if something reaches a physical manifestation, it's something that then requires a physical body remedy. So that's what the herbs are for. That's what the cleansing, the purification practices, different, you know, diet habits. That's where all of that comes in very, very, very handy. And yeah, I would never tell somebody who had cancer, oh, just take flower essences and you'll be fine. You just got to get to that root cause because it takes too long, but you can take them simultaneously and be working both layers with both types of remedy. There was this one herbalist that was heavily influenced by that. I think that your work really reminds me of, and it might help the listeners understand, you know, the relevance to herbalism and healing. Dean Martins is his name. He used to have a company, Herbs of Light, and it was very energy-based. He'd have all of his workers do Qigong before they go in. And his, his whole philosophy was that the energy is what guides the chemistries of the plant. Because you have this movement in herbalism to go to the nutraceutical model. You know, there's these magic monochemical isolates. We're going to standardize for them. And it's better than the drugs, but same idea. We're going to get 20 milligrams of curcumin and 50 <laughs> milligrams of spiritual. And that's, that's the key. But what he pointed out is that actually without the energy of the plant, it's almost like a consciousness or soul. All those chemistries won't actually go to the right place necessarily. In fact, it's the energy consciousness that guides the chemistries and it coordinates them. And, and when you talk about how flower essences work, I think about that because I think that ultimately that's kind of what it's about. Like there's a soul level layer. And I think our culture and even conventional herbalism, because it's been so beholden to scientism, has lost track of that. And, and, and that's what you do. You like connect to the plants and you you, you have a sacred relationship to them. And then they confer their gifts to you through this alchemical process that you use. And then we take them and we, we have the opportunity to feel that, which is really profound. What I like about that, what I like about the methodology is that it, it, it breaks through a habitual pattern that we have had over centuries of time of giving our power away to others. So we give our power away to religion. We give our power away to the priest. We give our power away to the doctor in the white coat, to the pharma industry, to the scientists. We give our power. We even give our power away to ayahuasca, right? We give our power away to something outside of ourselves that will make us realize something when in fact, what flower essences do is they show us that we are actually the ones who are awakening, right? That there is this incredible wisdom of plants that can simply just peel back the layers of who we are not so that we can discover who we really are. So that there's, you know, there's this, this sort of, we kind of, we just, we fall into it and I fall into it too, in the sense that, you know, like you were talking the brain, the supercomputer, like yeah. we, we, I get, I notice I get, you know, so seduced that I think, oh, I can figure something out by figuring something out. And then I have to step back again and say, wait a minute, that's not the way. Like there's a greater wisdom at play if I can just be in a state of awareness. And the mm -hmm. fact that our bodies and our minds are, they're like, like you said, they're built in perfection, they're like built to attain an awakening state, to be in balance, to be healthy. It's yes. more so when we give our power away to other things that everything starts to go awry. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, it's so powerful. I mean, sometimes you hear, you know, so new agey language about the transition to the Aquarian age. And, you know, I'm a student of empirical astrology, if you will. And in terms of astronomical 
you know, realities. Yeah, there's the procession of the equinoxes, and we are actually nearing the exact dawning of the age of Aquarius as far as where, you know, what constellation rises uh, during the spring equinox. And so we're moving from the Piscean model, which is more, there's a guru outside of us or teacher, or it's very pedagogical to really it's all within, but within a collective as well, because Aquarian is very humanitarian oriented. So I used to think that, oh, it's all within. Well, actually that's reduplicating the same Piscean dynamic of this like, you know, dichotomy between the teacher that's here and the student here. It's really a new model. And it's sort of like very much like the new biology. There's a decentralization that's occurring. You can look at it in cryptocurrencies actually as well. I mean, what Bitcoin represents and the blockchain actually on a deeper level, vis-a-vis -vis conventional finance, it's like extinction level events. And the same is going on in biology. Now we've decentered the role of the, you know, protein coding genes in the nucleus, which are completely seconded or third in their relevance to what actually makes us tick. It's like a revolution. In a way, losing control, but then also realizing that because we're networked and, and we're permeable, we also have a huge amount of responsibility and power to change our health destinies. Yeah. Why is that so important right now? Because I think we feel so, and we are so disempowered, primarily because of the way we view things. I do feel that the perceptual element is huge, but because, you know, it's such an interesting time because as far as surveillance capitalism, for example, or the reality that every single thing we do, I could power down my iPhone unless I take the battery out. And even then I'm sure there's like CIA programs that have made it able to still surveil us. There's nothing you can hide from. It's almost like the medieval, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God has returned in, in the era of, you know, sort of technocratic reality. So in a way it's liberating because that turns back on the surveillance state, if you will, itself. It's, it's, funny, so you, yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because if that, you know, if that sounds like a little out there to some of the listeners, We've actually been having conversations about this in the office where the girls are like, you know, what's really funny is I'm having a conversation with my girlfriend over dinner and we're talking about, let's say, grapes, for example. Then I pick up my phone because I, you know, got checked for a, a checking a text and then I end up on the internet and suddenly I see an ad for grapes or I, I'm on Facebook and I see an ad for grapes, right? And so my team was actually realizing, and this wasn't even based on something they read or heard. It was based on their own personal experience of, I say something and yes. my iPhone starts showing me something. And so they realized, oh, wow, like my oh voice my is being recorded by my phone. <laughs> well, did, you real, um, did you hear that with the revelations of Facebook's relationship to this company, Cambridge Analytics, that Facebook admitted they do record the background uh, audio, right? And then they'll, for advertising, for, that's amazing because what they're doing is they're replicating synchronicity on like a God level and it's, it's a surrogate. And you think that it's actually serendipity and it's, oh my God, this must be my twin flame because it can <laughs> I mean, but it's true on some level that, I mean, on some level, I met my twin flame, I believe because of the technology, but but not really. It was ultimately a higher order process, like quantum. <laughs> but wow, that's crazy. So you guys notice that happening. It's really happening. That's called surveillance capitalism. The idea is that the new oil for this century is, is really data. And those who control it and its movements, like Facebook and Google, etc., they're controlling far more than just capital. It's like our lives, our feelings, like our, it's our spirit spiritual destiny on some level, unless we do what you're saying, which is really become aware and then, you know, get back into our power, which is, I, I love that. Right. By through our own personal experience, because I think, you know, we, it's so easy to Google. It's like the Google God. We just type something in, we read it and it's real, right? It must be real. So how have you found um, with your website and all the thousands, I mean, how many articles do you have on your website? Well, total, we have probably about 50,000 between the study abstracts that have been curated, indexed, and then the articles written about some of the more powerful research. So. so what do you find the, what are your readers, what is the result of putting all of this powerful, clear and truthful information in their hands? Oh my God, Katie, it's been like 
a trip in my life because this was just some hobby I had in my like garage, you know, as I was full time worker. And um, the way the the internet 2.0 went is it just caused a flattening of all of these formerly powerful uh, sources of information and misinformation so that anyone who had a voice and a message that was resonated with the public became validated through, I, I call it social capital. So like the World Health Organization, some months would have less traffic you know, than my own site when I was really blowing up. And that's kind of crazy, the implications of that. And even Facebook would give far more virality to like my page or some of my colleagues than like CNN, like who has millions more followers, but people were really not getting into their content. So what that was showing was that really the hierarchy was imploded. Now, of course, there's many attempts to co-opt the stream of content on Facebook, but that was really what launched my brand into popularity was, I have to acknowledge, was the social media revolution. You know, it's still doing that. It's for many people. They just have something they need to express or they a simple meme. You know, there's a dog meme in cryptocurrency, um, Dogecoin, which is now has a market cap of almost a billion dollars. You know, it started as just as a joke. And then people said, you know what? We'd rather trade these Doge coins for our gaming <laughs> platform than like the U.S. dollar because it's, you know, feeding infinite war and, 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 and starvation, you know? So like we're in a completely different reality now thanks to these developments. Wow. And, and so if anyone is not, has not been on um, Sayer's website, highly recommend getting on his newsletter. He sends out these incredible newsletters and there'll be like six articles and every single one of them, I'm like, I have to read this article. They'll be like, you know, the health benefits of turmeric alongside like the dangers of jet fuel. Maybe that's one thing we should throw out there because I think a lot of people don't know you, sure. your, your highlight and Kelly's highlight of all this information was the first I had heard about it. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about what should we know about the air we're breathing in airplanes and how to mitigate that? Yes, it's such a great question, Katie. So I was shocked to find because of a very extended long distance relationship that required flight, that my immune system and my partners was starting to get really compromised. And for like over a year, we're like, what's going on? We're like, do all we can to be healthy. And it was because of the reality, which is that modern aircraft, even though this has been known for half a century, take the uh, air for the cabin from one of the segments in the jet engine. And yeah, I know, even hearing it, I hear myself, so I'm like, what? It makes no sense. It even takes power away from the um, jets to do this. It's called bleed air. Um, so, so it doesn't even make sense from an engineering perspective. Why wouldn't they take air from the outside and then add oxygen to it? <laughs> Thank God you asked that question. I would love everyone in the world to ask that question. It's amazing. So you're, they, why wouldn't they? they? They should because early on they noticed that some of the air crew, including the pilots, were getting sick. In fact, there have been multiple settlements now uh, done to keep, keep the serious issue you know, suppressed because, you know, these settlements, you can't necessarily go out there and shout the reality. But they use lubricants in these jet engines that, you know, deal with high temperatures, right? A lot of friction, one of which is called TCP, which was, you know, used as, 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 as a nerve agent. I mean, it's in a class of organophosphate chemicals that includes things like pesticides. And so when you're breathing the air in the cabin, the only thing filtering it out is the, the lungs of the passengers. They don't have sensors. They don't have filters. All that could be retrofitted overnight. The only thing that has happened, which further confirms how big this issue is, is Boeing released a while back the 787 Dreamliner, which was the first craft they produced that actually takes the air from outside the cabin using a very basic compressor, which is all you need. And then the, the, the crew get fresh air versus breathing in pyrolyzed, micronized chemicals from the jet engines, which there are hundreds of different chemicals that are released that get recirculated throughout the entire flight. You're already at a, a pressurized, you know, they, they, I think they pressurize the cabin at something like eight or 10,000 feet. So you're already in hypoxic states, low oxygen. Right, it's, right, right. It's just a nightmare what can happen over time if, if, if you fly a lot. 
So what would you recommend to people who fly a lot? Or let's say I've got a big trip coming up and I'm going to fly to Asia. What do you, what did you do to mitigate those effects in your body? You know, I go out of my way to try to make sure I'm getting a certain amount of antioxidants, like a, a, a nor- like a dose over normal. I might take a turmeric supplement, full spectrum. Some people will just do a matcha in the morning. I mean, that alone might help. It's not super evidence based, but we can assume that there's a lot of inflammation, oxidative stress that will occur. One thing that I have done, I think with some success, is use flower remedies. And that's why I was going to actually ask you at some point to tell us what you think would be the perfect formula from your line. I've used oak. There's another one that I just can't think of that that I believe strengthens my system. But there's also masks that have been produced attempting to get around the problem. Uh, And I don't know of any that I fully believe are effective, but the Cambridge mask was specifically designed to try to prevent um, the chemical exposure. And are they, does it block it out or are they nano enough that they can get? That's my assumption is that they probably couldn't block out much unless there's some kind of electrostatic component. It's very, it's very hard to know because the industry does not want this studied. There is a lot of uproar about it. And if you Google aerotoxic syndrome, which is, a, is I think, a very evidence-based um, a diagnostic category, there's a lot of articles about it now. And there are a lot of um, uh, airline groups, you know, the actual you know, employees that have been working on this issue for a very long time, but most passengers have no clue. And, and why does it not change? Is it because the planes we're flying on are like, you know, billions of dollars of investment and they're 20, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old? And is it, is it just too expensive to retrofit? Or is it that when we go back and f- is it, is it that the fact that if we retrofit yeah. it, we'll be admitting that we've been screwing up for many years and making people sick? Yes, Airbus, Boeing, these are massive companies that actually, I believe if you were to calculate their total liability for what they have already done inadvertently and now advertently or intentionally, it's probably a trillion dollars. It's like when a big grocery chain ends up putting like a health food aisle in their store. It, the implication is that like 98% of the rest of the stuff isn't healthy. It's the same idea with vaccines. They don't want to address, you can't even ask the question, are vaccines safe without being called an anti-vaxxer and being persecuted? Because there is about a trillion dollars of liability representing on a deeper level, the you know pain and suffering of hundreds of thousands of vaccine injured children in this country alone. So the vaccine industry all the way up to CDC will not acknowledge that there is any harm being done, even though they've paid out three point, what is it, $4 billion to families of vaccine injured and or killed children through the National Vaccine Compensation Injury Compensation Fund, which was started, I believe, in 1986. So it's all hidden in plain sight. They know that it does cause that damage. And for people who maybe are not as enmeshed in all of these topics as you are, what are some of the things that you see occurring with your peers who speak the truth? You know, I have to say, I think because of this Aquarian transition to being able to communicate like we are and the power of these alternative media avenues, I mean, you look at like the Rogan show and this podcast actually reminds me of it which i really like it's just youtube has displaced tv when kelly was actually on joe's show um we did a keyword i did a keyword search out of curiosity at the time you know there was like rumors about world war three with russia her name was over the searched more than putin like for like a two-day window was, yeah i mean one dude with you know <laughs> Okay, with right? a nice microphone. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I see that. It looks very pro. Um, but the, that's that's what that's what's happening. Is the mainstream media is just the most ridiculous. You know, it's just amazing that people even it's it's it, it, it's it's fluoride like as far as you know what it actually does to the brain. So I love that metaphor. So where would you recommend that people get news in terms of? you know, let's say what's happening in the world, what's happening in politics, what's happening with health and wellness. Do you have any source? Are there any sources of news that people could at least, you know, dip their toe into and see if it 
aligns with their values or seems like a reputable source to them? That is such a good question, Katie. Like, I I can't because I don't really myself even know at this point. And I and it's it's a point of empathy I have for myself in the world because the amount of information that we have available is so overwhelming that it's it's probably causing illness just knowing. At any moment we can Google something, at any moment we can access an infinite array of opposing views. And I think that's our modern predicament. I think one reason why my newsletter has been popular, and we have like 300,000 subscribers now, is because we send one thing a day as a lead that was saying, you know, we feel this is important. As, as your newsletter, same thing. People who trust you, who, who feel they know you and, and they want to learn more, they, they just want to simplify their lives. So... Yeah, it's um, a modern predicament to have access to practically infinite amounts of information and perspective as, and then know that you can really only handle so much. And that's where getting back in touch with your inner voice, your intuition, your body, all the things you're helping us facilitate to me is really the answer. And unplugging is actually from all of these sources is probably part of the um, way to... You know. I love that. Speaking of unplugging, can we talk about the sun? Yeah. So, I mean, what do you know about the sun that we should know? I love that question. It's a beautiful question because flowers, of course, you know, and all plants, they have figured out a way to get energy directly from the sun. And that's why they're called autotrophs versus heterotrophs, which theoretically have to eat other things to be alive, right? (laughs) Humans have been in that category of, oh, we can't get you know, energy from the sun. In fact, we better stay away from it. We're going to get cancer and die. And there's some truth to that, depending on your ethnicity, whether or not you can stay in the sun for you know a long period of time. But the idea is that um, modern biology, just in the past five years, has shown without a doubt that mammals can extract directly from the sun energy, but with one key ingredient, which is chlorophyll. So... When our body consumes chlorophyll, it's broken down into a metabolite, acronym PBE, that goes into the mitochondria and then helps to harvest the sun and other ambient energies and then accelerate the efficiency of the Krebs cycle and the mitochondria. So that discovery, we classified humans as photoheterotrophs, so we're in between plants and animals in, that, in, in the conventional sense of animals can't get energy from the sun. Why is that so important about the mitochondria? Because I think we always think of ourselves as just like these almost like fossil fuel burning machines, but glucose is the fuel, right? We think, oh, we have to get our energy from eating sugar and fat through beta oxidation, another way to produce energy. And it's really an illusion. In fact, I think it has a lot to do with the power of big food like cereal, grain, and sugar companies that have got convinced biologists that we're just these machines that need, you know, gas for our, our tank. And, and now we realize that, I mean, even the paleo movement is so gung ho, you got to eat animal flesh all day long. And, and it's, if you really think about it, why wouldn't evolution and the intelligence of nature, the goddess, what have you, not enable us to take advantage of an infinite source of energy, just like the fossil fuel power grid and nuclear, et cetera, is still trying to convince people that you shouldn't put solar panels on your house and detach from this global earth-destroying energy grid. You know, it's the same idea. So the new biology is actually kind of now dovetailing with this sort of new energy movement. Mm, yeah, I notice myself that when I am in places where I'm getting more sun on my skin that I don't need to eat as much. I'm not as hungry. That's interesting, Yes. And yeah. and and what does that have to do with regeneration? Because I know that's the title of your book and the cover's so beautiful. When is it coming out, by the way? Thank you. It should be out in uh, May of 2019 through Hay House. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, thanks. So so yeah, how does that what does that how does that relate to regeneration? Okay, so I am just blown away when one looks at what all living things on this planet share in common. Really, we think a lot about DNA, and that's true, but The reality is that there are these stem cells within all living things and the germline cells specifically, which all tie back approximately 3.4 billion years to the last universal common ancestor. So that original organism 
has been replicating for 3.4 billion years that, that protocell cell and is still living. There's an immortal thread in every one of us. And, and in fact, every one of our tissues has a little niche or nest of, of these stem cells that ultimately come from that zygote, you know, of mother's sperm and I'm sorry, uh, mother's egg and sperm. So what that means is that there's this immortal element to our nature. And, you know, we're just like this blob of protoplasm or jelly, really, you know, we're 99% water molecules by number. It, we're a miracle, really. Um, so that resilience, what that represents is a resilience that we often overlook. When we really look at the role of stem cells, if it's in the heart muscle or if it's in the brain, not to... Far back, it was believed that you couldn't regenerate those tissues, but now we know there are specific stem cells within those tissues that can be induced naturally to replicate and regenerate and, and differentiate into healthy tissue. What are the implications of that? Well, it undermines the fundamental premise of the allopathic model of medicine, which is that fundamentally we're you know very error prone you know, gene-driven machines. And a lot of our defects come from the fact that, you know, we inherited these bad sequences and basically uh, entropy rules, right? Our bodies are pretty much poorly designed and, and they break. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's a miracle. Oh, so depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. Versus the reality, which is that in biolog biological terms, you know, we, we can be on a whole spectrum of, you know, age, but you, you, you can regenerate and you can turn back, you know, sort of the hands of time simply by altering very basic things in your lifestyle and diet. Like what? Um, okay, yeah, it's a good question. Well, here's where we tie into your amazing work because what happened in the past uh, 250 million years is that the angiosperm plants, when they came onto the scene, I think that was not till, what was it? I'll have to figure it out. Let's just say in the 200 million years previous, angiosperm plants, which are flowering plants, they are at the root of about 70% of what we consume today as food on this planet. And the uh, mammals, they started to become dependent on one another. And the archetypal you know, example of that was our arboreal ancestors in the jungle, right, is that they learned to cooperate with fruit-bearing plants to basically consume the delicious flesh of that fruit in exchange for dispersing seed because in the jungle, wind dispersal wasn't available. So a lot of our physiological infrastructure came from adaptation to that habitat. And then the relationship between flowering plants and their fruit and mammals really started to take off. So now what happened is that we've forgotten this, but a lot of the regulation of our genome is actually dependent on plants and these certain foods. So that's the new biology is understanding that the regulation of our genome, the complexity of our species is actually based on RNAs, which is about 90 8% of our genome, which is 3 billion base pairs, is not protein coding genes. It's transcribed, but not into you know, messenger RNA and then protein. Wait, what does that mean? Break it down for the layperson here, because I'm, okay. I'm starting to fall off the, the cliff. Yeah, I know, I know, glazing over. I, know. <laughs> I trust me, I get it, because it's just so unfortunate that the scientific language is very hard to translate in a compelling way. But let's just say that if you look at cancer, Obviously, it's not caused by a deficiency of radiotherapy and chemotherapy, but I, it, is, it is caused by a lack of certain foods because those foods contain literally genetic material that regulate and control our gene expression. So it was be believed in the old biology that the genes lock, had all of the information needed to coordinate our cells. And now we know technically that we depend on certain foods in order to have health and wellness. So, so the, the discovery is pomegranate's a good example. This is okay. a blow on, is that in the animal model of what they call overectomy induced menopause, they take the, I know it's violent, it's vivisection, it's really quite sick, but they take the ovaries out of the animal and it, it causes within a few weeks for them to have typical symptoms of menopause, like midsection fat, depression, and uh, rapid demineralization of the bones. One group is given pomegranate, 
which is the fruiting ovary of the pomegranate bush. And when you slice it in half, it looks like a human ovary. And that group doesn't have any deficiency sim uh, symptoms. It's as if they never, never experienced having their ovaries removed. Why is that? Well, the, the, the pomegranate actually contains bioidentical steroidal hormones. It has estrone and even testosterone and other forms of estrogen, which is just amazing that they found this out. So on some level, it's working like a natural hormone replacement. But on a deeper level, there are microRNAs there that are also stimulating regenerative pathways in the body of that animal. And that's an example of where in legend and multiculturally confirmed, pomegranate it really does represent prosperity and fertility. And yeah, you know, it wasn't just something our ancestors imagined. It was actually prolonging the life and well-being of those individuals. So that's an example of where the new model of understanding how to optimize gene expression, if you will, will looks at certain healing foods that were passed down through ancient traditions and that often have lore and legend behind them. It's interesting you say pomegranate because that's the number one flower essence we recommend for women at any stage of life. It it can even just, I mean, typically you you want to be using flower essences around five times a day to really notice the effects, but even for even just using using it once per day can regulate cycles, help women understand their most, you know, fertile days. It can eliminate cramps, it can regulate cycles. We've had women who haven't cycled in months, uh, you know, start getting into a regular every month. Um, so it's it's pretty fascinating. And wow, I had no idea. That's really awesome, actually. That even, yeah, that sort of opens up the question of like, okay, so we are getting, if we eat the fruit, yeah. which sounds like we should all do, yeah. we're getting a transmission of genetic material that's instructing our bodies how to regenerate and, and be vital and young and radiant and beautiful, right? Yes. And, then, and then in the flower essence world, there's something possibly similar it's just in like an energetic packet yes that's that has a similar effect oh my god it's beautiful yeah because of these amazing uh experiments that occurred recently luke montagna uh i think i'm pronouncing his name correctly is a Nobel prize winner who discovered the hiv virus in 1999 supposedly and um because there's a lot of debate over what he discovered because it's also potentially a natural exosome in the body that's hijacked by the hiv sequence but he did a teleportation experience experiment with dna that was like published in nature and he was able to show that by basically projecting electromagnetic wavelength through this test tube that contained dna to one that was in separated in space and time um he was able to reconstitute to the dna molecule in that other test tube if you put the right just free nucleic acids in and so the energy and information in the electromagnetic wave actually formed life. And, and that is, 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 is sort of similar, I imagine, to when you take a tincture and you take that information, you ascribe it into the water, which downloads it and is able to retransmit it. Why? You might see a similar effect, even though there may not be bioidentical estrone in that remedy, but it may even be more effective in some individuals because of what it's transmitting, yeah. It's pretty wild. Totally, because science <laughs> now is like saying that Katie has has figured out the best way to deliver, you know, a, a medicine versus Merck or even some big supplement company. Scary. <laughs> yeah, there is this flower essence called Self Heal that is so amazing because it it activates the body's natural ability to heal. And you you referenced like you know, what flower essence would you offer to people who are flights or, or their immune systems are compromised? And I just love that, that there's actually a flower that exists on the planet that will activate our body's immune systems to flourish and not necessarily work harder because it's not that the body becomes compromised. It's this sort of opposite that it, it just recharges everything and makes it very effortless to heal ourselves. Totally. That sounds great. Huh. One other thing that I think is not widely talked about, this is taking a total turn here and sure. we'll, we'll, I know you need to get going, so we'll wrap up soon, but anything you can offer about those strange trails of smoke that we see in the sky? I, I live in Arizona and when I was a kid, 
I used to travel to Arizona to see my grandparents. And I remember the skies were just like pristine and blue always. And there were never any clouds in the sky. And now we see these, you know, huge plumes of weird mm. stuff. And I know that, you know, there are some naysayers out there who like to call them contrails, but I personally have seen a difference. And I, I'd be really curious if we could actually measure, because here in, in Arizona, it's so dry and dusty that people can actually feel a physical difference when we've seen a lot of those in the sky. It would be so interesting if we could measure intakes in the hospital yeah. after a big, big run of those. What do you know about that? Is there any research? Is there any? Yes. What's the real deal here? You know, I love that you are asking that because I did the same thing as like, I, I started to notice not just in my local area, but a lot of the pictures you see, I mean, there's literally crisscrossing patterns that those are not commercial jets. I mean, just clearly. So I was like, well, okay, in the 30 million approximately citations on Medline, there's got to be some reference to this phenomena. And I, I did find on my site, I actually have a, a section on I think it's under geoengineering, and it, it looks at research that's from the government, for example, on the military, admitting that they have released uh, certain amounts of like aluminum-based particles, et cetera, to try to control radio patterns. But then what happened was a few years ago, a researcher out of San Diego who started to notice a lot of this activity decided to do an assay of the material that was literally like a landing in the area. And he found that the blueprint chemically, uh, so to speak, the atomic elements in that material, it was identical to coal fly ash, which is a byproduct of power industries that use coal. It's highly toxic. It has a lot of radioisotopes and things like barium and the things that you find. And, and his, his explanation is that they're using it for geoengineering uh, purposes, covert, of course, because when you've decided that global warming is run amok and that the entire species and planet might actually die, it enables the government to do things that it wouldn't necessarily tell the public. So I believe, yes, that we are seeing in instances this happening and for different reasons. Sometimes it might be a military project. Other times it might actually be related to geoengineering. And there's also, by the way, a documentary called Artificial Cloud, which is highly worth watching, that discusses that even if there is no covert program, and you just look at the effect that contrails have on the planet, you'll find that the weather modification implied already by, by the change of clouds is so, so dramatic that I, it was published in Nature, I reported on this one. After 9-11, when there was the first ever like national ground stop of all flights, the temperatures literally changed several degrees the next day because it affected so much the you know relationship between the sun and the surface of, of you know, North, North America. So it's a topic I would definitely explore further. On Greenman Info, there is one called Why the Chemtrail Conspiracy, in quotes, is real. And then we reference this particular paper published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal on the uh, geoengineering component. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much for making all that information available to us. This is such a huge service. And just to end on a high note, you know, because there are obviously so many, so many things in our environment that we can't control, that we are working with our lifestyles and our diets and our meditations and our flower essences and our matcha teas to, to rebalance Maybe just can you throw out like five of your favorite like yummy herbs or plants or rituals that you do to stay at the top of your game? Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I just sit. I was doing like a Kundalini yoga practice for a couple of years every morning, which I think is a, a good thing too, if that resonates. But I've gone to the more sort of default Zen, just sitting approach. And I find that 90% of it is just clearing out things that I really need to have thought through me <laughs> that may residue from dreams or just my to-do list or like some relationship that I'm not like understanding. And it's just so helpful because if you don't take that time and let your system kind of clear stuff out consciously and just staying aware is just a great start to your day. So that's my number one thing. And I would suggest people try it out if they haven't. Then I always make exercise a big part of my day. 
just deliberate movement. It could be washing dishes, gardening. It doesn't have to be some heroic task, but <laughs> you know, I find that that is huge in terms of my well-being. And I believe I'm starting to be more convinced than ever, ever it's more or as important as diet, like meaning you get so fixated on what is the right thing to eat, how much, and right. oh, you know, it's endless. Like endless. And it's orthorexic. You're pointing the bone at yourself like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, <laughs> like almost you feel unethical if you eat something that you shouldn't in your mind. But I do focus uh, on foods as medicine a lot. And I love to incorporate raw berries into my diet. I will say that my research over the course, like 15 years, leads me to the belief that eating berries, and I'm, I really love blackberries especially, I believe that they contain so much healing energy and actually the research is really compelling already out there on that, that that's something I would totally incorporate. Always try to get some raw plant material organically sourced into your diet daily, not just for the enzymes. For many years, people thought that was the primary reasons, but it's also for the plant stem cells. Like I'm starting to realize that that immortal thread we're talking about, when you consume that, the amount of power that is present within those is not calculable through chemical analyses, but energetically, I'm sure you get it. It's like just infusing you with profound resilience. Um, and then I'm a huge fan of turmeric. In fact, I've gone to the point in my research where I have to acknowledge that I do believe that this plant is literally here to be compassionate towards our species. Like the research is so compelling that right now we have was it 2,900 uh, abstracts indexed from Medline on its benefits over 800 different conditions and having 160 distinct pharmacological actions, that my belief is that it needs us to be whole and, and healthy for it to also realize its purpose on this planet. It's almost like this consciousness pact between these two planets. And in the ancient Vedic culture, it was identified as an emissary of this compassionate light. And there's several goddess names to describe it. So I do think that that's one that we should take in whole form because the tumor fraction, which is fat, can stimulate brain regeneration much better than curcumin, which has other functions. So the whole plant has hundreds of biomolecules. I think you asked one last one would be, um, I, you know, I'm starting to become such a fan of flower remedies, thanks to ah, you. Yay. you know, <laughs> I will say, I wanted to tell people this, like I, I was introduced to Bach remedies early uh, in my life, and I was always shocked by how effective they were for psycho spiritual issues. Like, I would be dealing with serious, you know, life tragedy, take a few drops, and it, it's just getting to the point where you'll let yourself heal almost. You have, there's almost such a, um, you know, such a, a barrier there to, 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 to feeling like you deserve it, right? That it could be that easy. And you pointed this out to me recently, I'm in total agreement, is that, I don't know, I think that we, we, we can heal very instantaneously, or we've maybe been in train to think we have to go through some heroic path or experience a micro trauma, just, just to heal, like, oh, we have to go through death rows, like you said, certain psychedelics and other plant medicine might actually participate in that self-flagellation that's not necessary. So I, I will say that I believe flower remedies are one of my primary go-tos for health and wellness, especially moving into the new biology where, as you said, emotion is really at the core of what it means to be healthy. And the etymology is still there. Disease is disease, and even health comes from a, a root with the word holy. So it's like it's already there, implied in the language. I have to ask you if you've heard about that study, and I I'm the worst with studies. I don't remember who did it, where it was, but this woman was, uh, one of my peers was telling me about, she was in Germany and they were working with a group of people and there was, they were, so it's like, you know, you can call them subjects or patients were in the room and then they were surrounded by what were, you could consider as medical intuitives. Okay, so this is not like a, you know, double blind study, but they were looking at the effects of identifying imbalances in the body. So for example, let's say a patient comes into the room. Did we already talk about this? I can't remember. Really okay, so patient comes into the room and you know, whether it's medical intuitive, whether it's Chinese medicine pulse reading diagnosis, whether it's looking at your tongue, 
Well, maybe it's an allopathic, you know, identification of something by listening to your heart. They would identify what was imbalanced in the patient. And then they did a series of these patients. And then they all went to lunch. They had lunch. And then they came back and they looked at the same group of patients one by one. And they found that over lunch period, that whatever was imbalanced in the body had already started to shift towards balance. Wow. And so it just makes you wonder, right, in terms of what you were saying about, geez, it doesn't have to be heroic. It doesn't have to be this like really arduous traumatic thing. Is it possible that similar to your meditation practice in the morning, when you're sitting, I'm sitting, and we're just observing what's happening in the mind. And the the moment that you turn your attention towards the observation, things already start to shift and change and sort and relax and let go and everything becomes a lot more effortlessly calm, right? So then then you wonder like, wow, we invest so much energy into like maintaining our physical form and staying healthy. Is it really possible that if we just could identify what was happening in our bodies that it would automatically shift and move toward balance? Yes. Isn't that wild? Oh, yeah. No, that's really powerful because I think that's truly what is the most promising aspect of, of this, this new biology that I'm seeing is that just the fact that we exist actually biologically is still a miracle. No one can... <laughs> if we have the... I mean, even the, the, the theory that suddenly a self-replicating molecule popped out of the void 3.4 billion years ago is still a theory. In fact, the panspermia hypothesis makes more sense, which is that life was originally deposited here through meteor action, probably fungal type form, which means life could have been 11 billion years old, even further back. In other words, it's like that vision, you know, also implies to me that we can manifest out of the void. I mean, there's whole scientific disciplines based on this, like diagenesis, like how do air plants just manifest their materiality, like on like a copper wire. You're talking about those gorgeous air plants that live off of air. Yeah. Yeah, like we're like air plants. Like we literally have a cosmic stream of nutrition, which requires no physical inputs. We manifest what we need out of the void. And then there's the earthly one. Your terrain is more on the side of the cosmic with flowers. I mean, you look at the image of a flower and it's this example of the most insane, benevolent superfluity of the universe. The fact that it exists versus not exists did not have to happen. And that, that, that's simultaneously an experience of beauty and like awe and like abundance. And that's opposite the model that, again, psychically, physically is destroying the planet and sapping everyone's energy. So I feel like that's sort of implied, I, I think. We're, we're, we're moving into this new place. Last, providing the technology. Yeah. Last question for you. How, why is it that? Um, that 99% of people who in my realm or community are taking flower essences are women. And how do we get more men to, great. to be interested in flower essences? Like you oh, seem sort of like an anomaly to me. <laughs> have, you know, it's like, I have to acknowledge. And I think that any enlightened man will acknowledge that women are born with a profound advantage. It's amazing that, you know, in, in my own evolution, I've only just now come to a point where I feel held by men in a way that I'm starting to feel a little bit of what women probably naturally have a greater affordability to is. So in other words, 99, when you told me that 99.9, see, I, I'm at about 75% of our followers are, are women. And I'm always very proud of that. But it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that you are already the caretakers of the world. You're already the healers of the world. Like, it's, it's just afforded to you in a different way than men. Men have to try harder, have to learn differently. I mean, we're not even allowed to cry still. You know, like how does your soul come into your body if you're not allowed to cry and, and be seen by other men, right? And not feel shame. So it's really interesting. But, you know, men are more adopting the military, uh, you know, model of medicine and treating their body, you know, badly. So that's part of it. How will we get men to do this? I think they just need fancy high-tech language. I mean, we can talk about quantum biology, right? And just like, (laughs) no. So I think it will take them having a scientific framework, if you will, maybe 
some of them will start realizing, okay, wow, I, I might increase my muscle gains or, you know, it'll make me, you know, more, more, more sexy. I mean, I think it's true, right? Women are, they like men who take, in, they, they like men who even know what the word self-care means and are constantly working on themselves and care about their emotions. I mean, emotional intimacy, all that is like at the root of real power. How are you going to do that without flower remedies? You're not going to do it through alcohol. You know, you're not going to do it through a bunch of like protein powders from GNC. <laughs> you're going to do it by following Katie Hess and uh, her amazing women tribe. <laughs> you're but, cracking me up. <laughs> I don't know how, it's true. I observed your events like in New York and I was just so amazed at the devotional energy and sacredness that follows you and, and those who work with you. And it is amazing how few men were at the event, but there are more coming. And I'll certainly, as I meet more enlightened men, I'll be inviting them. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Thank you so much there. Well, I'm very much cheering you on and I can't wait until your new book is released. Um, no. so we'll be waiting for that. That's Regeneration in the Spring of 2019, right? And in the meantime, for the listeners who would like more of Sayer's Wisdom, an incredible compilation and curation of amazing resources, like literally, I feel like everyone must go to this website and it's, it's greenmedinfo.com. I know your episode is going to be one of the most popular because oh, I met you through Kelly and Kelly's episode oh, yeah. is by far you know, <laughs> one of the most listened to. So, <laughs> Well, I'm just blessed to be on this show. I really am. Thank you. Really, really appreciate all of your your hard work, your effort, your wisdom, and what you're bringing into the onto this planet. So, thank you so much for being with us here. Is there any last, like, one little bite, a nugget of wisdom that you find yourself sharing with other people quite commonly? Oh gosh, I guess it's just as basic as really learning, like self-compassion like it's taken me my whole life to get there and it's amazing how much we self-flagellate and how afraid we are of our own power and so i'd say we're all working on it and the best way to communicate is to just be that and like you know i see you doing that a lot of these other amazing powerful women and some men coming online so yeah i really love that definitely self-compassion yeah Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for listening to the Flower Lounge podcast. We now have listeners in 61 countries. And I just want to say that I'm so grateful that you'd spend your time with us. I also want to take a second to give a shout out to Lotus Way, who makes this podcast possible. We recently released a new flower essence blend that has been a game changer for us. In fact, it's called Game Changer. And it's a combination of the most powerful flower essences for being totally present. Because if you, like me, you might have experienced on occasion having a really big to-do list, a little overwhelming, feeling constantly on the go, and the sense that time is flying by. Where did last week go? You may want to check out the Game Changer. It makes you feel like you have all the time in the world. You can take breaks without feeling guilty, like you should be doing something else. You feel crystal clear with the ability to make decisions really effortlessly. And things that seem kind of heavy or a pain in the butt on your to-do list to do before now just seem like super easy. So if you have gotten any value out of listening to the podcast, we'd love your support. We're currently under contract to buy a new building where we'll be able to open a store, have an education center, offer botanical treatments and flower licks or happy hours, and have a cool new podcasting space that will be a major upgrade from where we are now. So at that time in the fall, when we move into our new space, we will have had a year of podcasting under our belt and we'll be starting up a whole new format that you're going to love that will be even more engaging and interactive. So again, thank you so much for your support, for listening and for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.